Hi everybody, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We are in section 10.3, looking at direct and indirect statements. If you remember in the previous video, I introduced what direct and indirect statements are, and then we looked at the four different ways that you can form a direct statement in Greek. Go back and have a look at that previous video, if that's news to you. This video, what we're going to do is we'll look at how to form an indirect statement in Greek. Now, just to remind you about the difference between them, uh, we're talking about uh, sentences which often contain a verb of saying, but they might contain a verb of hearing or seeing uh, or something like that. And they are either quoting or reporting what somebody has said or seen or heard or something like that. Example, a direct statement would be something like this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. It's a direct statement or direct speech because the part of it where I said, I am the way, the truth and the life is directly reporting precisely the actual words that were spoken. Contrast that with indirect speech or an indirect statement. You'd, uh, if you wanted to say the same thing, uh, you would say, Jesus said that he is the way and the truth and the life. You can see the difference there. You are not necessarily reporting precisely the words that he said. You're re reporting the content of what he said. That's what I want to look at today. And the good news is, we're looking at page 118. The good news is, there's just one way of doing this in Greek. And it is as follows. You use this word. Oh my goodness. There's me writing it down without the rough breathing. Well spotted, all of you are thinking, he's made a mistake. Yeah, he has, he's tired, it's the end of the afternoon. All right, hotte introduces an indirect statement in Greek. Now, before you all go, hold on a second, hotte can also introduce a direct statement in Greek. How on earth are we supposed to know the difference? Don't worry, just press pause for a second. We'll come to that in a moment. But for now, let's work out how this works because there are also some quirks about this that you need to understand. Okay, so let's go from the top. Kusen hote Jesus ketai. Kusen hote Jesus ketai. This is the example that Duff's got right in the middle of page 118. And it's fairly straightforward. This is from Akuo, epsilon augment and sigma suffix here. Third person singular aorist. So that's he, she or it heard. He's got she heard, because it's a quotation from John 11, actually. So let's just honour that. She heard. And then hotte, we translate that. Now, pause a second. You don't know whether hotte means that yet, do you? Because you know that hotte can also introduce a direct statement. And if it's a direct statement of direct speech, then in general, you don't put that in English. So what you can do is you put it in square brackets or something in your notes, just to remember you've got to come back to it when you figured out whether this is direct speech or indirect speech. And that's what we're going to get to at the end of the video. But for now, let's work out what it says. Jesus erketai. Jesus erketai. That means... I'm going to draw a little box around this for reasons that will become clear in a moment. And let's go green. Jesus is coming. Jesus is the subject. And he, a kamai, a ker, a ketai, is coming. We could easily, equally translate it to Jesus comes, but in this context, Jesus is coming is more idiomatic. I notice one little quirk here. Um, in the Greek of John eleven twenty, where this exam comes from, the, the article is missing from before Iezus. And I've told you before that uh, in general, Greek uses the definite article, sorry, the article, there's only one article in Greek, the article before proper names like Theos and Iezus, but that's just in general. It doesn't always do so. And here's an example where there is an exception. You can see why there's an exception. There's no ambiguity involved in leaving it out. And therefore people tend to omit things that don't add any extra information. That's why they would have done that here. So she heard Jesus is coming. Now, 
couple of little puzzles here. The first is the tense of this verb. And here's where it gets a bit tricky. Sometimes people get tangled up here. As Duff points out, and we're looking at the key grammar point on the right hand side towards the top of page 118, when Greek is reporting indirect speech, it uses the tense in which the original idea would have been expressed. Just think about that for a minute. We don't use the past tense if at the time when the thought was expressed the present tense was used. We used we use whatever tense was used at that time. So just think about how you're going to translate this into English. In Greek, what she heard at that time when she heard it was the idea Jesus is coming. She heard that back at that time. She heard that. And then what, she, what does she hear? Jesus is coming. However, when we translate this into English, English does not use the tense of the original words or thoughts when it's giving indirect speech. We use the tense that reflects the position of that action in relation to where we are now, not the position of that action in relation to where the thought was first uttered. So what we'd say in English, if we were translating this, is she heard that Jesus was coming. Now, I've tried to work out a way of explaining this so it makes sense to people. And here's the best way I've thought of, of doing it. Consistently, in direct speech and indirect speech, and in direct and indirect statements generally, always, 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 Greek uses the tense that would have been used at the time to express that thought or those words or that idea. That's the key insight. It's not that Greek does something a bit odd, it's that English does something a bit odd. In English, when we report, sorry, when we give direct speech, we do indeed use the tense that was used at the time because we say precisely the words that were spoken or heard or the thing that was seen at the time. But in English, when we're doing something in indirect speech, like this example, we change the tense so that it reflects the fact that this hearing of Jesus is coming, this hearing happened in our past. English does that funny switch, but Greek doesn't. If you think about it like this, that Greek, to repeat myself again, but it's an important point, Greek uses the tense of the original words or thoughts, whether it's in direct speech or in indirect speech. It always uses the tense of the original words and thoughts when it's reporting something directly or indirectly. Then you'll be right in your understanding of it. And then what you've got to do if it's indirect speech is you've got to work out how do I express that in English? Now, in general, that's kind of tricky, and it's not really very easy to, to um, give you a general rule for that, because, of course, this verb, ekousen, could be in any one of a number of different tenses. Um, could be in the future, could be in the imperfect, could be in the aorist, like here, or the present. It could be in the perfect tense. We'll get to that later on. And all of those will introduce complexities and subtleties into how you translate that into English. But here's the key thing. You can do that. You can do that in English, provided you understand what the Greek is doing. And to repeat myself again, what the Greek is doing is giving you the, the words or thoughts that are being reported indirectly 
in the tense in which they were heard or thought at the time. That's the crucial thing you need to remember. Then once you realise that, then you can put it into English and this of course is how we would do it. She heard that Jesus was coming. Okay, take a deep breath. The final thing we've got to figure out then is uh, if hotte can be used to introduce both, oops, dropping pen lids, both direct and indirect speech in Greek, how do we tell the difference? And the way you tell the difference is just from the content of this and the context generally. You've got to look at it and if all you've got is hotte, you do need to remember that it could be direct or indirect speech. Now, that's where you need to uh, have a, uh, a look um, at the content of what's said and try and work out, does it make sense for this to be uh, direct speech uh, or indirect speech? Is one of them more persuasive than the other? It gets debated among grammarians. And in fact, some suggest that there's even a sort of fluid boundary between the two which is fairly straightforward to understand, given this grammatical structure for expressing it. Sometimes it will be a little bit unclear, and that's okay. Sometimes it will be unambiguous, and it won't be possible for it really to be conceivable that it is in direct speech or in indirect speech. And you'll be able to work that out from the context. But that should help you, I hope, to work your way through this little section right here, section 10.3. Okay. So keep, stay tuned. We're going to come back next time. We'll look at section 10.4, time expressions, and there's some cool stuff to look at there. Uh, again, Greek has a very efficient and neat way of expressing time, which is really cool, very, really easy. Once you've got the hang of it, it's used all over the place, and that'll help you a great deal. But for now, keep going with this stuff. 10, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. God bless, and bye for now.